recently got back from an expedition to the Bering Sea when I was aboard a icebreaker and following the um, oceanographic research of this amazing project. That's a three-year project to figure out what's kind of happening with climate change and how it's affecting the Bering Sea ecosystem. And we all know that the Bering Sea ecosystem is very prolific for our commercial fisheries, king crab and Alaskan pollock, which is actually one of the largest fisheries in the world. And you have like fake crab and fish sticks for mostly Alaskan pollock. So because of that, it's very important to understand there's seasonal sea ice in the Bering Sea. And with the changing climate and possible warming and the possible, you know, um, recession of the sea ice, which is seasonal, and perhaps in the near future we won't see the seasonal sea ice, what's going to happen to this inlet, to the ecosystem and what impacts will it have? And so I was long on this expedition to document it. And to answer your question, it's basically, I felt compelled to share the work of these scientists to really get it out to the public quickly, to know that so that the public would know that all of this amazing research is being accomplished and being done to try to understand what's going to happen. And the most important thing I came away from it was that it's not necessarily negative what could happen to the ecosystem up there. It may be positive. We know that there's changes happening. And so it was very interesting to see the feedback that I got as well, but through film and really just to share it. I mean, of course, it's always selfishly, you know, self-exploration to go on any sort of expedition, but to try to bring that into a greater good for public knowledge and to, you know, really contribute to science. Um, you know, change comes from within. Um, you know, every avatar and spiritual book and intelligent politician would say that. Um, you know, we've all, I think, maybe even been in relationships with families that someone tries to change us, and as a result, we try to change them. Uh, a lot can happen by acceptance and sending out love, as opposed to intolerance and prejudice. And likewise, that has an effect on the bigger picture. And I, I believe everything starts within. And as we begin to change ourselves to something that we aspire to be uh, or do, um, it has an effect on everything and everyone. And you know, demand for organic food is going up. Demand for bike lanes is going up. Uh, awareness of what automobiles and um, uh, what we're doing almost unconsciously to the planet and it's all about education, that's why this film festival is fantastic, and you know, things like Ode Magazine and things like that. It caused me to rewrite my first book and update it, and add a couple of chapters on how to even envision all the things that we're doing on the inside to happen on the outside also. Um, first of all, my name is Eric Hunter Slater, and I just wanted to take a moment here as an environmentalist uh, to ask you all to join me in a round of applause to thank uh, Ms. Pamela Peters for daring to show us a better way to live. I think you touched upon it best earlier with speaking about the tipping point. It's my gravest fear that we have passed the tipping point and that if we are to survive at all as a species, we must study the example of people who are succeeding at reversing that position and see if some, in some humble way their lessons might not touch us in the Northern Hemisphere to follow the success stories that they have achieved in the Southern Hemisphere. Mm -hmm. One of the challenges we have in portraying this in that there is such a massive body of global science going on at work here and ever increasingly the attention span of the global public is diminished by so much information being bombarded on them on a daily basis, that we have chosen to follow in the path of thinking of the legendary filmmakers Godfrey Reggio with his Kowanskati series and um, um, Ron Fricke with Baraka by taking the science out of the equation and removing it to a supplementary exhibit in the museum so that when the public comes and sits see these immortal truths. They will be presented only by the most powerful and poetic images, narrated only by the most soulful and moving Aboriginal and house music. Um, I think my best capacity to address that question is to just talk about some of the, the, the legislation that was recently passed that you know is going to have an immediate effect on 
on the environment here in New York City. Uh, because, you know, one thing is that um, you know, Mayor Bloomberg created an Office of Long-Term Planning and Sustainability. This is the office that, that drafted Plan YC and all the 127 points in Plan YC. And um, one thing about the office is that it was, a, it was an office of Mayor Bloomberg serving at the pleasure of Mayor Bloomberg and there was no guarantee that it would continue to expect. But the irony of irony is the, uh, the Office of Long-Term Planning and Sustainability was sort of a temporary office. Um, you know, serving Mayor Bloomberg. Uh, we wrote a bill in the city council uh, codifying it into, into, the city's, uh, into the city's budget as a permanent office. So now the Office of Long-Term Planning and Sustainability will be permanent. So no matter who comes along after Mayor Bloomberg, we will still have this office working to implement the points of Plan YC. Thank you all for coming. We are going to have another session, of course, next year because it's an annual film festival. And I would say celebrate life.